Hello, everybody. People are rolling in. Welcome to Letterform Lectures Online Edition. As you're coming in to see Sophie Byers talk today, please uh, drop where you're coming from in the chat. We're always curious to see um, where our audience lives. So please uh, say hello, introduce yourself, and tell us where you're coming from in the chat. Um, Let's give people a few more minutes. Whoa, 100 and almost 200 people so far. Woohoo. Okay, keep them coming. We'll give people a few minutes to roll in. And um, just want to say welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for this uh, super special letter form lecture. Um, let me take a peek uh, where people are coming from. Oh, my Lord. Okay, all over the world um my my uk sweden montreal brazil san jose california las vegas woo germany all right oakland california hello folks woo everywhere romania gabon spain okay we truly have an international audience today this is very exciting uruguay Belgium, India, ah, world tour. Okay, um, everybody, let's get rolling here. Um, welcome to Letterform Lectures Online Edition. My name is Grendel, and I am Education Director at Letterform Archive, which is also the home of Type West, our school of type design. And I'd like to wish everybody a very, uh, Feliz Dia de los Muertos. Happy Day of the Dead. That's this guy's favorite holiday, in case you couldn't tell. Um, so once again, we do have an international audience. Please type in where you're coming from in the chat. And if you have questions for Sophie as uh, the talk develops, please drop them in the Q&A and upvote the ones you'd like to see answered. I would like to give a big shout out right now to Skilla Zaccolini, without whose work in the background, this lecture series would not be happening. So thank you, Skilla. Woo hoo. Okay, let me talk for a second about uh, the Type West program of type design. Letterform Archive is the home of Type West, which is a year long postgraduate certificate program in type design. And we have three 10 week terms throughout the year. This includes weekly classes in type design and type history. Also two uh, weekend or weeknight workshops. And in 2022, we will have an online cohort, which offers the advantage that you don't need to travel to join the program. We can take students from anywhere. Hear that worldwide audience? Um, and in 2022, we're going to have an in-person cohort again, which means you'll be able to take full advantage of all the resources of Letterform Archive itself since we have over 75,000 original works of graphic design history available to students, including thousands of type specimens. And our classes are taught directly from this primary material. Okay, breaking news. The application period has been extended for two weeks because we heard from some prospective students that they were unsure about the new two program structure or they only heard about the opportunity right at the application deadline. So in the interest of making sure that everyone who is interested is able to apply, we've decided to extend the deadline until November 14th at 1159 PM Pacific time. So if you're interested in our program, you still have time. And once again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to message us and ask them. So to find out more about the Type West programs and to apply, go to ledarc.org slash education. Okay, we have a couple more lectures on the horizon before the end of the year. Uh, first, in two weeks, professor and scholar Dina Ben Brahim will take us on a tour of the varied letters of Morocco and the cultural, social, political, and linguistic context in Morocco from which they developed. So do not miss this fascinating talk. And tune in on November 30th 
for a lecture by Gabriel Benderski Perez on the rich history of Uruguayan graphic design. As Perez explains what circumstances led him to found an Uruguayan national design archive. Okay, to find out more about these and other events, to see past lecture videos, or just learn more about Letterform Archive and how to visit, go to letarc.org slash events. And better yet, become a Letterform Archive member. Stay in the loop and get cool perks. To hear great lectures, uh, to help keep great lectures like this one today going, go to letarc.org slash join and become a member today. Okay, welcome to Letterform Lectures 2021 Fall Edition. Letterform Lectures are co-presented by the Letterform Archive and the SFPL Main Library. Letterform Archive is a nonprofit institution housing over 75,000 works of graphic design history. We are dedicated to the art and the craft of the letter form. And we'd like to thank Adobe for generously sponsoring the video recording of this lecture series. You can view all letter form lectures online soon after they happen. Just check our website, letterformarchive.org. Okay, today's lecture is a very special talk with Sophie Beyer on the science of typeface legibility. Bayer is a scholar, author, and professor at the Royal Danish Academy, where she heads the Center for Visibility Design. Sophie and her research team are investigating the many assumptions of what makes a font legible. Sophie has written several books, including the Invaluable Type Tricks, uh, a go-to for type designers everywhere. And she's published numerous papers on typeface legibility as well. So we usually ask our lecturers to tell us an unusual or interesting tale as part of their introduction. And Sophie blew us away by recounting what happened to her brain immediately following the birth of her child. Sophie suffered a case of what's called preeclampsia, which affects the area of the brain responsible for processing visual information. So, she gave birth. The next morning, when they brought her the hospital breakfast menu, she couldn't read the type. She couldn't focus on it. And she thought, oh, it must be just the stress of the birth. But later in the day, when uh, she went to the bathroom and saw the soap container, she had the same problem. She thought the label on the soap was written in Cyrillic or some other alphabet that was unknown to her because she could not interpret the forms. As a professional type designer, she was in a bit of an understandable panic about this. Um, fortunately, the condition was temporary and her ability to recognize letter forms returned after about a week or two. And being a scholar, she wrote a fascinating monograph on the subject. Uh, and we'll drop a link to that in the chat if you want to read more about it. OK, let's extend a very warm welcome to Sophie Beyer. Take it Thank away, you very Sophie. much. Thank you. I'll just share my screen here. All right. So yeah, so for the next hour, we're going to talk about what makes typeface legible uh, looking at science. Um, so yes, I'm head of Center for Visibility Design at the Royal Danish Academy. And uh, here at the center, we work with uh, typeface legibility. We look into that. We look into pictogram legibility, and we also work with uh, with data visualization. Uh, today's talk is going to be about typeface legibility. So we 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 are sort of, we we are highly interdisciplinary. So we have people with backgrounds in graphic design and background in psychology. And as you're going to learn later today, this, this combination is highly important to actually come up with, with the proper results. Uh, we use a, a methodology called a psychophysics. Uh, and this is a very sort of a highly validated methodology from psychology. Uh, and basically what it is, it is that we measure the re relationship between the physical stimuli and the perception of it. Um, so in doing that, uh, Understanding what a variable is is, is uh, greatly essential. So be able to isolate a variable. 
So this is sort of a very simple example. So if you have like a, an, an experiment and you want to hear what kind of house people would prefer to live in. So they, they're shown these two houses and, and the majority chooses A. So what, what can you use that data for? So you don't, so you can say, okay, so uh, most people like house A, but why is that? Is that because of the colors of, 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 of the walls, the windows, the tree, the door? What, what is it? We can't really transfer this knowledge outside of the specific situation. However, if you do it like this and compare these two, and again, people choose A, then you know it has to do with the tree. Uh, and basically this, this makes completely sense and obvious, but, but it's not that obvious when, when you look into the literature. So traditional legibility researchers have had a tendency to, to compare different typefaces. And, and when you do that, the similar issues uh, come along. Like in this case, these are not that different. And you could say they're both serif typefaces, they're both sort of high stroke contrast, but they have different X heights. And that also means that they have different width they have they, they and and when they have different x heights you also have different perceptual sizes so whenever if you compare these two fonts you don't know if it has to do with the x height or this or the perceptual size or the width or whatever so that way you need to know what it is that you're measuring so today i'm going to show 10 examples from what we've been working on at, at the center um, the first one has to do with letter weight um, so this came about as me sort of uh, wondering what was going on when you have like if you have like one font weight like in the top row here you have you have a regular weight all the way through so if you have that weight and then you gradually decreases in size the small size appear much lighter than the than the larger size and to make those two those look the same you actually have to adjust it so in the lower row you see that the the, the by the end we actually have the bold weight and they appear the same all the way through. So, so what, would, what, what does, will this do to legibility, basically? So what we did was that we took, we took a range of different weights here in, in, in this uh, typeface of mine uh, and, uh, and tested. And, and what we did was that we had, so, so participants were to look at the dot in the middle, and then there was like a quick exposure in the periphery of, of a single letter. And the task was to name that letter. Uh, and we did this in three different sizes. So we had so the small size, which is uh, equals 3.5 point, uh, uh, point if you have a, sort of a regular distance to the screen, medium six point and large six, uh, nine point. Uh, and what we found in all three sizes would, was that the extra light weight, the one called one here, was significantly more difficult to recognize than the other ones in all three sizes. Uh, but what was also interesting was that in the medium size, the six point, there was a significant difference between the relative, you could say the medium or the bold, the one called four, and the regular called two. Um, so, so this is an indication that in smaller sizes, it is actually, um, it, it improves recognition to have a certain boldness to the letter. The same finding didn't show in the small size. And, and we sort of speculate that that probably has to do with it being so small that you almost couldn't see it. Uh, and, and that in research, you call that that, 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 it hit, uh, that it hits the floor. So you can't, so all the smaller details disappear because it is so difficult. So basically, so we showed that in the one end, everything sort of the performance declined. That didn't show in the other end with, with, with the boldness of number five here we had. So we wanted to run a second experiment where we looked into that. So we took the two funds that showed difference in the medium weight, the two and four, and then we added an, an extra black version in number six here for the second experiment. And again, what happened was that, and, and this, is what, this is when science is amazing, when you are able to replicate your own findings, because that means that, you have, that, that there's something in it. So again, here in the medium size, six point, we replicated our previous finding in finding the difference between two and four, four, again showing that for smaller sizes, a certain level of boldness is important. But what we also found in both cases that the extra black impaired performance compared to the others. So we basically, so, so we showed this, we had this effect of like the extremes, lower, lower uh, legibility uh, in, in both ends of, of the scale. The next one is uh, we call bold and contrast. So this is basically so a, a lot of some of um, 
some of these experiments that I'm showing here, I kind of call them low hanging fruits because these are these are things that designers have been saying for years and years, but no one ha have actually ever tested them. Uh, and I think that's fascinating that it's interesting to see, okay, so is there a validation in this? And one of these sayings that designers have said, said for, for years and years has to do with, with high stroke contrast funds that, that they are normally known as being uh, bad for legibility. Um, so, so I created these three different uh, funds here. And again, trying to isolate the variables. So they have the same perceptual weight, they have the same width of the letters, the same spacing, but the only thing that varies is the contrast between, be, between the funds. So we have two extremes and then we have a medium in the middle. And again, similar experiment as before, focus on the middle, uh, at the dot in the middle, and then expose uh, letters in the periphery. Here we have them in what's called a trigram. So we have three letters in a row. And the task is to re rec uh, or identify the middle letter here. And we also did the same in, in the center of vision, which is called the fovea, where also again here, identify the middle of it here. And what we found was basically in both cases, the same pattern, that the high stroke co contrast was significantly more difficult to recognize than the two other, the low and the middle. Uh, however, there wasn't any difference between medium and low. So in that sense, you could say, okay, as long as you have some level of, uh, of, uh, of sort of, of, of um, strokeness in, in the lighter parts of the letter, then, then it appears to be fine. So the next one has to do with, with digits. So when you look at the legibility li literature, it's quite interesting how little uh, that has been done on, on the digits uh, or, the, or numbers. Uh, because when you look at uh, work, in, work into letters, you have both you have the letters to recognize, you have the words, you have the sentence structure. There are so many other things to, to draw on when, when you try to identify a word uh, or a letter um, that you actually can go quite far with, with letters being difficult to see because you have all the information around. When you talk about uh, digits, you can't do that. Like you can't guess a digit in a number. You have to be able to see it. Um, so in this experiment, we were interested in to see sort of the, the effect of different skeletons within the digits, because th these are all sort of fairly normal ways of designing letters or, or digits. Um, and so, and we were interested in seeing which, how, how they perform compared to each other. And again, similar experiment, looking in the middle and then exposing uh, the, the digits to the, to the side and to the button. And, and in this case, the task was to name all three. And so for the number, number one, we found that the top one was more legible than the two lower ones. And, and this is kind of interesting, I think, with the number one here, because often you hear that you need to have, like you need to make it broad to be visible. And you need, uh, and, but, but, but I think what happened in this experiment, and, and this is something to, to sort of to consider, is that when you have a digit or a letter that is considered to be a narrow figure, then if you suddenly make it wide, then it is, so the, the, the notion of that digit or that letter disappears and you think it must be something else. Or in case of three here, the two top ones were more legible than the lower one. And nine, top one more legible than the lower ones. And seven. So, okay, so then we, so th we looked at that and then we, we, we started looking into, so, okay, so, so the different skeletons, they have different levels of complexity, although they are, so they're not that different that you, you would still, if you sort of draw a line throughout the, the, the digit and like in this case, and then pull it out in, in long thread, then the one that has the longest one, if you say that's the most complex and the shortest one is the least complex. If we did that, then something very interesting came, came up, which was that when you looked at all three digits together, if they collectively were least complex, they actually had a recognition rate of 92%. While if you had them collectively be most complex, they were, the recognition rate was, was all the way down to 65. So, even, so I think this is interesting in, in the sense that these are not highly complicated. These are small changes in the details. 
and they still have this significant effect on the recognition. So if so, collectively the top is more legible than the lower one. And again here. All right. So takeaways from this: open counters to digits and and no added details, basically. So that was the digits. Now, what about the letters? We also have issues of, of uh, open and closed counters here. Um, we did that in another experiment where sort of I, I, I created the three different versions here of, of the letters that have uh, 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 closed and open counters. Uh, and again, like small changes in, in, in the design actually, uh, but still, so we're interested in seeing how, how that would, would uh, affect re uh, recognition. So similar experiment again, focus on the dot in the middle and then uh, flash, flash the text to, to the sides. And we did that both when, when the letter was flanked by two other letters in a trigram, uh, recognizing the middle, and when it was presented in isolation, unflanked. And what we found here was that when the letter was pre presented alone, there was actually a significant difference between the closed, both in relation to the medium and to the open. Um, while when it was flanked by others, for some reason, the difference was only found between the closed and the open. So there's some different effects here going on. But overall, you could say that, yes, it is true. Closed counters do impair recognition, as you see here. And the explanation for that is, is quite obvious, I think. Like, and, and, and this is an experiment from 2008 where the researchers we're interested in seeing, so what, what, what are the parts of the letters that makes us recognize them? And for example, in this letter group of CEO, which tend to be often misread for each other, it, they showed that, that we, we look at the parts that differentiate the letters from each other. And, and obviously, so if, if the C had a very close counter, uh, it would be easily re uh, misread for, for the O, you could say. And that can also be explained by the Gestalt law of closure, which says that basically if you have a round shape, the smaller the hole is, the more the eye tends to close that, that gap, basically. So the fifth experiment here has to do with complexity in letters and words. So you remember the, the digits uh, experiment where we were also interested in complexity. Um, and others have looked at complexity, sort of showed that sort of very swashy, script faces are more illegible than simple fonts. Uh, but, but what we were interested in was what happens in between. And I think especially be, with, with variable fonts, um, we, we need to understand, we can't just look at the ex extremes, we need to understand what goes, goes on in between. So, so here we, we designed a font specific for this experiment that gradually decreased in complexity um, and tested these four versions of it. And we did that in two experiments. So the first experiment was the one similar to the ones we already looked at, letter identification. Um, and what we found here was basically that between these four different font styles, there was a significant decre uh, in, um, decrease of recognition. So it, it got gradually worse and worse, more difficult to recognize the letters between the, the four stages. So in the second experiment, which is, was uh, a word identification task or a lexical decision task is also known as this, uh, in, in, the, in these experiments, um, the methodology is to present the participant to a word or non-word. And then the task is to mark if it, if it is a, a word or not. Um, th this is Danish and, and the top one was a word. Um, and what we found here, was a different pattern than the other one. So in this case, we actually found that there was evidence for no difference between the two least complex and evidence for no difference between the two most complex ones. And then between them, they, that was, they were significant different. So why, why is this different? Uh, I think that can be explained by sort of, of how this model of how we read. So, this is a very simple version of it. Reading is com very complex. It involves a lot of semantic, perceptual, cognitive uh, processes. But, but overall, you could say there are sort of these two different mechanisms going on at the same time. So from the bottom, you have this feature detector that sort of first identify the features of the letters and then the identify the letters at the same uh, as the next step. 
At the same time, you have from the top, you have sort of a lexical of all the, the, the words that you have read throughout your life. Uh, and then you sort of, you, you match that with what comes from, from uh, below. And, and that way it's sort of having these two, two helpers at the same time is the most effective way of identifying a word basically. So if you think about the word recognition and that task, you also had the word detector level, which you didn't have in the letter recognition task. So, so my thinking is that that, that supports basically, that, that supports uh, participants ability to read uh, more complex funds for longer time in, in the sort of in the gradual decreasement of complexity. So trigram letter width. Um, here we were interested in the effect of, of letter width um, and we tested these uh, three different uh, uh, funds. Uh, again, so this is a, a condensed version and this is the expanded one. And what we found was uh, here, we, we tested both in the paphobia, which, which is at, at two, two degrees out in the periphery and then at 10 degrees further out in the periphery. And, and what we found was a similar pattern here that the condensed fund was significantly uh, more difficult to recognize than both the Roman and the extended in both cases. But what I think is the, the real amazing, interesting finding here is that the Roman was also significantly better than the extended fund. And thinking that we actually, that all text normally is set in Roman, I think that that is interesting that the, showing that the extended is actually when it comes to letter recognition, uh, more significantly more uh, easier to recognize than Roman. So eye tracking with letter word. So, so this is this is what interesting with this research field also that you can basically so you can identify sort of a parameter within type design that you're interested in, and then you can expose it to a number of different measures because reading is so complex that it involves all these different stages. So, so the experiment so far I've shown um, uh, related to, to letters and to words, but we also have sentence structures, which is also a, obviously a great part of, of most reading experiences. And when we read in paragraphs, what we do is that we basically we fixate on the text and that fixation is something that we are highly informed about. Like we use our periphery to decide where that fixation should be. And between fixations, we have what's called a saccades. So, so these it's a saccades are these jumps between fixations. Um, and this pattern can vary depending on, on the reading situation, the reader, and uh, apparently also the, the typeface. So again, we we're interested in, in, in letter width. So, so we, we uh, tested these four uh, funds this time around. Um, and they varied on, on, uh, on, on letter width. And there was also a slight variation in, in the spacing. So what did we find here? Find here? So number of fixations, that was actually, there was a significant difference between the extended and the ultra condensed, meaning that the ultra condensed had fewer fixations than the extended. And that in a sense makes sense because the extended, because it's, it's um, it is much wider. It took up more space. It took up more lines of text also uh, than the ultra condensed did. But also, um, yeah, no, yeah, number fixation. That's it. Fixation duration. That was what I wanted to talk about. Fixation duration, ultra condensed again was uh, different than extended and Roman in this case also. Uh, and, and the difference here was that the fixation duration was longer for ultra condensed than for the other ones. And that sort of, and that, that goes back to the previous experiment where we found the letter recognition of the condensed was more difficult than the other ones. So basically, so, so it's more difficult to recognize the letters here and therefore we need to fixate for a longer time. But maybe also while we fixate for a longer time, we process more in that period. And saccade duration. So, how long was the saccade? That is also a difference between ultra condensed and, and all of the other ones. So, <clears throat> so we show all these different patterns. So, so, so participants basically they assign different reading strategies depending on the fund. 
But what I think is, is interesting here is that actually when we looked at reading speed, there was no difference between the four. So that indicates that even though that we, that, that a fun can be difficult, we find a way to cope with it um, and then end up with the same reading speed. That being said also that all these experiments that I've shown so far, they have, they have been tested on, on young normal vision adult readers. Uh, and as I will talk about later, that also, that, that does not go for, for everyone. So this reader group that, that we in science tend to uh, test, they, they are quite adaptable. But the reason, reason why we use these also that they are kind of a uniform group that you haven't, when you are a young adult, you haven't, you haven't reached a, a, a time in life where, where you start to have deficits in your reading. And that makes it easier to sort of test sort of basic stuff on, the, on this group. So that leads to the next one here, which has to do with low vision readers. Um, so AMD is a, an eye disease that, that affects a lot of older people. Uh, and, and what happens when you, when you get this disease is that by time you, are, you, you risk losing your sense of vision, basically. So if you want to read uh, with AMD, you need to use your periphery to reading. And that is extremely difficult because information in the periphery is scarce, and you and 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 you have and you have also you have to sort of ad, adapt a new reading strategy uh, that you haven't used your whole life. Um, so others have looked into how so how can we help this reader group uh, actually read, uh, and they have tested multiple different font styles. Um, and and uh, in all cases, all these uh, other experiments, they actually they, the, the experiment involved uh, Courier and Times New Roman. And in all cases, they found that Courier was more easy to read for this group than Times New Roman. Uh, but that, that made me curious, again, back to being able to isolate uh, variables, because these two fonts are so different. They have different weights, they have different contrast, they have different structure, different width. All things, spacing is different also. So all those things, so why is it that one should be better than the other? So if we don't understand that, then the only thing we can learn from this is to say, okay, all text should be set in courier for low vision readers, but we don't want to do that. Um, so what I did was that I got permission to also Times New Roman, uh, and then I, I sort of, so I made um, different versions of Times New Roman that kind of tried to isolate parameters from courier. So on the top row here on the black, I took the weight from, from Korea, uh, and then below that, uh, the, the, the width of the, of the letters, and then trying Times New Roman with greater spacing. And for that, we used the, the Ratner reading chart. Uh, so this, this is a sort of a, a reading chart that is highly used within optometry. Uh, and, and basically what it is, is that you have Sort of you, you have these paragraphs that have been controlled, so they have the same difficulty levels, and then then you have participants read one at a time and out loud, and then you you measure their performance and different parameters. Um, so in regard of what's called reading accuracy, which is the the paragraph that you can read, where you can read most of the words or eighty percent of the words, sort of okay. So the time where you start to struggle. That's called reading accuracy. And when we looked at that, then this reader group of, of uh, low vision readers, they are, when, when they were reading with the wider font, that was, they had better reading compared to Times New Roman. And when they were reading with the spaced font, they were better than Times New Roman. We didn't find anything on, on the bold version. Uh, so basically this way we show that what, what are the parameters in Curia that makes that more legible than Times New Roman. And this is something that can be transferred to other funds, of course, so, so, so we can produce new funds for, for this reader group. So the next one here has to do with older age. So um, in, this, in, in this experiment uh, example, I'm, I'm gonna show a bit of, of work by others in relation to, to, uh, to age and, uh, and reading. So this first experiment here, that has to do with, with the sort of blur and noise in relation to age. Um, 
So what? So this was also a lexical decision task, naming a word, non-word, uh, with different uh, blurness of, of the letter or, or the words, or, or add, added noise to them like this. And what these experimenters showed was that for the for the older group, this was basically this was the limit of of how they how blurred the text could be for them to recognize it. Um, and this was the limit how how noisy it could be. For the younger, the, these were the limits, and as you can see, the, these are very different. So the, the younger group they could see like much more blurred and much more noise than the older ones. So in another experiment, this has to do with, with crowding. So, so basically, so letter crowding is, is a very important phenomenon within reading uh, research uh, in, in that when you, when you present letters in the periphery, and this is also why the many experiments before were in the periphery, uh, what happened there is that, that, that the, the letters kind of seem to merge. So that means that when you look, look at, at the cross in the middle here, it's much easier to recognize the Y when it's isolation than when it's flanked by the E's. Uh, so, so that is letter crowding. So younger people, they basically, they, they can recognize the Y with, with, less, uh, with, with more tighter spacing than older people. O older people tend to need the, 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 the flanked letters to be further apart from, from the target letter for them to recognize it. Um, also, older readers need the, the text to be closer to the fixation to actually read the same as younger readers. Older readers are also uh, often affect, uh, negatively affected by, by sort of distraction. So, so in this experiment, uh, the researchers asked the, the participant to, to read the text and ignoring the regular uh, words. So, I'm going to give you some time to read that. So these were the words that you were supposed to skip. And for younger readers, that, that is an easy task, while a lot of older readers uh, tended to, to struggle with this. So, so older readers, they, they, they find it difficult to, to uh, disregard the uh, elements that are irrelevant. Uh, to, to the main content of the text. Okay, so that leads on to that, to, to our part of this experiment. So, so this is a bit different than the other ones as this was uh, a, a commission word, work. It was, uh, so the city of Copenhagen contacted us because they, they, uh, they used to have Gil Sands as their uh, main uh, corporate uh, uh, typeface, uh, but now they, they wanted a new one. They asked uh, the design agency uh, E-Types to develop a new fund, which was called a KPH. Um, and this fund comes in, the, oh, in different, oh, I thought I had a slide there, all right, okay. So this com fund comes in, in different sizes or different styles where, where, where there's some more complex letters in, in the, the display version than the, the text version. Um, so we tested and they, they wanted everyone, like they were interested in, in all age groups being able to read this. So we tested both older and younger participants for this. And again, the retina reading chart, we used that. And here we found that on, on the measure called critical print size, which is the smallest size where you can actually still read with ease, which is different from reading accuracy I showed before, which is where you struggle. So, so with this measure where you can still sort of, this is okay for me to read. Um, we found that the older readers, they, they read significantly smaller uh, font sizes with KBH text compared to Gil Sans. But what we also found that was that the, the young readers, they didn't struggle, at, or that, that there wasn't any difference here at all. And also, as you can see here, that young readers, they, they could read much smaller sizes than the older ones. So why is this that Gil Sans was sort of more difficult than the, the, the text, uh, KBH text version. That probably, if, if, you, if we go back to, to our previous results, that could be explained here in that it, it is lighter in weight, uh, it is more condensed and it has uh, less spacing between the letters. And, and even though the younger weren't affected by that, we see that it has an effect on, on the older readers. So if you want to design for older readers, have larger font sizes, 
no dis distractive uh, elements or unusual font choices, uh, high contrast between the foreground and background, uh, and remember to focus on legibility. Okay, so that leads me to the final experiment here, which is a bit tricky. Uh, so here, we were interested in stroke and contrast. So, so, so far I've tried uh, mainly to sort of to work on isolating one variable. But in this case, we, we kind of needed to see what happened if we compare two variables. Uh, and, and this came sort of from an interest in that uh, sound serifs generally ha have um, a low stroke contrast, while serif typefaces generally have a high stroke contrast. And often when, especially in the reading uh, uh, research literature, when, when, when there's a great tendency to compare sans and uh, serif and serifs, and, and always only talking about the, the, the aspect of the serifs, while you have these other features that, that are very different. So we wanted to see if it, how, how stroke contract actually would affect the presence or absence of serifs. And therefore design these, these uh, four different fonts, uh, where you can see here, so we have, so two have serifs, and different contrast. And here we have the different contrast. So basically, so, so the, the two variables are sort of controlled within the four test funds, if that makes sense. Um, and we ran a lexical decision task, na naming the words in small sizes. Okay, so what we found was kind of surprising all the way through. So for sans serif funds, if it is a sans serif fund, low stroke contrast, was the, was the most legible or was this the smallest size that it could be recognized, the word could be recognized. But if it was a serif font, it was the other way around. High stroke contrast was easier to recognize in small sizes. And this was for normal vision uh, younger readers. We also ran this experiment with low vision readers. And what happened here was actually exactly the opposite. So in sans serif, it was the high stroke contrast that was easier to read in small sizes. And in serif, it was the low stroke contrast that was easier to read. So that that still puzzles me and we are, we are trying to find out what's going on. And, and we've been looking at some different directions and I'll, I'll try to share them with you. So when reading, uh, we or, or when viewing an object in different sizes, we, we use spatial frequency channels. That means that when you see something up close, you use the higher spatial frequencies. Like, like, like in this case, th this, is the Im this is the same image in two sizes. So when you have it in large size, you draw on the higher spatial frequencies, which means that you can see the F in the image. You can see the details, which belongs to the high, uh, higher spatial frequencies. In small, smaller sizes, you draw on the lower spatial frequencies, and here the D shape comes, becomes visible. Low vision readers generally struggle with the higher spatial frequencies, so they don't have that sort of part of the spectrum, and they have to rely on the lower spatial frequencies. So that could possibly be part of the explanation for, for, for the findings the other way around. Um, we then looked at sort of, we, we, we tried to make graphs of, of, of uh, the, the visual uh, per perception of, of the, the fun styles. Um, into power spatial densities, uh, uh, graphs as you see them here. And when we sort of study that, then we can see that there are actually similarities ac across uh, the, the fun styles in relation to which perform better and worse. Um, for example, you can see here that point in, in, in the sans high and the serif low is actually at a different spot than on, on the other ones. It's lower on, on, on the frequency uh, uh, scale and that this part is visible in these two and not in the other ones. But generally, like this, 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 this becomes very complicated and obviously this is not something designers can do before they design or release a typeface. But I think this also tells us that there's so much more information to gain from this and that we need more people to look into this. And I think also that this last experiment also shows that the fact that variables interact that it's not enough that we only work with one variable. So then we can do that as a beginning as we've done now, but then the next sort of obvious step would be that we start comparing these. So we have, so we look at weight in relation to width also because that would probably also change. 
Um, so, so that is the great thing about being a researcher, that you keep finding new things to look into and, and add to the knowledge of the world. And I really love that. Thank you very much. Oh my, amazing, amazing talk, Sophie. Um, we have we have so many questions piling up. I mean, All right. we, we really do. So um, everyone's giving you uh, kudos in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, I'm gonna grab the questions. Reminder to people, please upvote the questions you wanna see answered in uh, the Q&A because we may not be able to get to all of them. There are so many. And I'm going to try to type the uh, the answers as they come through um, so that there'll be a recording of those in the Q&A as well. Okay, Sophie, uh, first question, we have Pascal Schmidt, who says, uh, is there a difference in legibility depending on the medium, print versus digital? Um, I think there used to be, and, and I think that there's, there's a huge amount of research from the 90s, uh, looking at computer screen and looking at TV screens. And obviously in those cases, there were differences. But I think today with the screens we have today, I, I, I don't believe that there's any. Uh, I th the, the main difference from paper and screen is basically that on the screen, the light comes from behind, while on paper, the, it is reflected. So, so that could have an effect, but, but I don't believe the pixel anymore has an effect of reading. Okay. Um, sounds good. So one, one question for me, which I think somebody may even have asked in the, uh, the Q and A as well, is that your experiments, were those all done on paper or on screen? So uh, the retinal reading chart, those experiments were on paper, the rest uh, were on screen. Um, and basically that is because on screen, it's so much easier to control. And, and so, so you, you have a, a program that, that collects the data behind. Well, if you do it on, on paper, the, like, like collecting that data, that took forever and ever. So you need to, so you need to record participants and listen to it again and, and time them. And so it's, it, basically it, it is easier to collect a lot of information on screen, basically. Oh. Thank you. Um, we have another question here from uh, Paula Laval, who asks, did you find that individuals read best what they read most? Um, I, ha I have in a previous experiment from a long time ago, we actually looked into that. Uh, and what we found was, and in, in that case, uh, we, we tested uh, sort of normal fonts that people are used to read, Times New Roman, Helvetica, and then compare the reading performance to fonts that were highly unusual. Uh, and what we found in that experiment is that, that uh, after just 20 minutes of practice, that, that the reading performance actually of the unusual font styles actually reached the ones of Helvetica and Times New Roman. So within 20 minutes, you can actually, your reading speed can get to the same as, as familiar funds. Uh, but then we also asked them, so did you enjoy reading this? And that didn't follow along. So after reading 20 minutes, even though the reading speed was the same, people still didn't like it. So basically, so, so that tells us that the reason why letters are still so much the same as they were like 500 years ago, that has to do with the reader being conservative. It's, it doesn't have to do with reading performance, actually. Wow, that is fascinating. Um, they didn't enjoy reading the unusual fonts, huh? Oh, no. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Sophie. Here's another question from uh, Thibault Menz, who asks, what do you think of Atkinson hyperlegible font? I, I don't. I, I, I don't want to talk about specific fonts. That that's not uh, my thing. No. Okay. Um, we did have those uh, that team on uh, as a letter form lecture a little while ago. So it's, yeah, I know. I know. I saw that, but I, I would rather okay. not answer. Okay. Okay. Um, we have a question from Lisa Zimmerman. Who wants to know, can you recommend any tools 
that we can use to test for legibility or readability of typefaces or design? Or is there even a tool to test eye tracking? Uh, yeah, yes, there is, but 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 that is like you need to know stuff to use that. I think I think if if you are if you're just yourself in your studio, I think like a very simple task is is the one to to put up your letters on the wall and then walk far away and then see which one you read the easiest. That 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 is an old trick and it still works. I think. Awesome. An oldie but goodie. Okay, thank you. Oh, and then Aaron Mall comments that 3M has the tool for eye tracking. But as you said, maybe you need to know the science to, to actually yeah. benefit from it. Um, Harant Papazian asks, might white space be playing a larger role than skeleton complexity? Um, I, th I think, um, yes, I think, I think that that is an important point. And I think in many ways, Sort of, and and we also looking into that in other experiments that this the, the balance between black and white. So start looking at that and start instead of looking at it in isolation. I think I think that is a, a, an important way forward. Uh, so both the white and the black together. Okay. So you're you're working on experiments with that as well at the moment. Yeah. 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 Okay. Knocking down these questions. Lisa Liskavoy, sorry if I ruined that name, um, asks, what about the relationship between stroke weight and the openness of apertures and counters? Uh, she find, Lisa finds it difficult to separate those two aspects. In other words, when the stroke weight is heavy, is it the stroke that negatively impacts legibility or is it the impact of the heavy weight on the crowding of the negative space within the letter form? So Lisa's curious if you've been able to isolate these variables in your research, kind of like the previous question a little bit. Yeah, huh? I was about to say that. And I think, I think th these, these definitely relates that, that it has to do with, with how, how we balance black and white. Uh, and, and also as, as as, as I mentioned, that that I think that the next step for this would be would be to look into how these variables interact, because we can't. It's also kind of an imaginative idea that we actually can isolate a variable because we all know that other things happen. But we could do it as good as we can, uh, and then learn from that, and then step on top of that and look more into it. Uh, yeah. Okay. But I, I agree that that the way the way the counter closes that can be done in multiple ways. Yeah. Okay. So excellent. Um, remember, everybody, of both the questions you want to see answered, we still have thirty nine questions open. So let's upvote those winners. Um, Anastasia Lara asks. Legibility versus readability, which one would you think is the priority when creating letter forms? I think it depends on what the usage of the font is. So if, if you're designing for signage, then I would definitely say legibility. If you're designing for running text, that would be re readability. You mind briefly defining the difference between Yeah, those? yeah, sure. So so legibility is is sort of the clarity of the letters and how how whether you can recognize the individual letter well while readability is sort of more about the the it being comfortable reading that that you that you are not disruptive in disrupted in your reading so okay. so so that's also the difference of between sign designing for science or designing for long distance reading and and designing for for paragraph reading Excellent. Um, Alan was wondering if these results would be true for non-Latin scripts, for global scripts like index scripts, for instance. Yeah, it, that, that's a good question, and I think I think we can't say that all the everything can be transferred, but 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 um, and 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 other researchers are looking into to non-Latin scripts. I I haven't had time for that. Like, I, there's so many things to do just with the Latin. Um, but but I think generally you could say that that some of the findings that has to do with perception can can relate to to non-Latin letters as well as they can also relate to pictograms 
uh, and, and, and images because it has to do with perception. Okay, excellent. Um, that's interesting about pictograms as well, right? It's not, we're not just talking scripts, it's everything that we can mm -hmm. identify. Um, let's see, uh, Edson Atwood asks, I read about a study that said in some cases, a less legible font may increase comprehension because more concentration was required. Thoughts? Yes. Yeah, there, there has been some a, a lot of literature on that. And I, th I think I can say that in general, that, that is not the case. So so basically, so so these papers they, they take, they are inspired by by some findings from, from the learning literature where basically where they find that it's easier to catch. So you learn better to catch a ball, for example, if you if you catch the ball with different distances. Uh, so so training different ways of of of, uh, of catching and that will make the one way of catching easier so basically so 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 that idea, making it more difficult will make the task more memorable uh, but i don't think that so there have been multiple papers on that and and some have the early ones have been highly criticized for not being uh, valid enough uh, there's been uh, some in recent years, there was a lot of hype about a typeface from Australia that should was supposedly to be able to do this. But afterwards, multiple two or three papers I've seen came out actually proving that wasn't the case. Uh, so I, have, I haven't seen any data that actually sort of truly confirms that to be a thing. Okay, so we're still uh, looking for data on that one, but yeah. it's an interesting question, right? It really is. Um, let's see. Kevin Woodland asks, Sophie, are there any examples for typefaces that pass all of these contemporary legibility tests? No, I don't think so. And I think also, again, that that and that I, I, so we, I, I didn't show it here, but we have examples of how the same font have like can be good for one condition but bad for another. Uh, so so this this question that I always hear at dinner parties. So what what is the most legible font in the world? I, that that that's, it doesn't exist. So it depends on the reading situation. Yeah, which makes it probably really hard to test sometimes, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Susanna Majek, Majek uh, asks, have you considered how your research and the specific results that you got could be affected by your interviewee group? For example, the Danish society being used to certain typefaces. Uh, Susanna is thinking of official or historically relevant typefaces in relation to the preference of the digits or assessing complexity. Or are your results highly generalizable? I think I think that is a good question, and, and I don't think I can answer that. So so I think we 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 showed so in the previous experiment I talked about where, where we showed how how quickly readers actually adjust to a font and and uh, come, uh, so unusual font get to the same performance level. So I, I would argue that the experiments that that run for a long time. And eventually, uh, the participants read a familiarity with whatever they are presented with. Uh, but but I don't know. It it could be different. And 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 what what I really really would like to do is and and which obviously is impossible. I would like to see what I would have liked to have a test on on the effect of serifs run before uh, sans serifs were popular, and then trying to replicate that today. But unfortunately, the experiments from back then weren't good enough, so we can't really repeat them and sort of get anything from it. Oh, that would be fascinating. It's too yeah. bad we, we, maybe you can work on time travel next, yeah. Uh, yeah. next project. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, David Jones asks, is there research looking at ligatures, both the common mm -hmm. ones like FI or FJ, uh, like seats for ST, do ligatures help? 
I, I haven't seen any. Um, so that is something worth looking into. My, my, my guess is that they disrupt the reading flow, but who knows? Okay. They disrupt. Okay. Yeah, I guess it would depend on how the eye, like what you were saying before, how the eye perceives like chunks of letters or parts mm -hmm. of letters. You know, it seems like maybe if we were trained to identify those ligatures, then perhaps they would be helpful. Um, but that's just speculation. Um, so Dimitri uh, Golub asks, with what technology was it printed, offset digital, or maybe laser printer? I mean, the research on font size on the first slides. Yeah, so they, they were printed. They were printed on on a, a digital printer that had like extremely high resolution i can't remember it now but but we we looked into getting the best possible uh, prints so, so so it it didn't smudge as small sizes okay okay um dc scarapelli asks are these data contexts sensitive to where the respondents live and what type they've been exposed to for their whole life for instance, might high contrast type be less legible simply because folks in 2021 see less of it? How does one adjust for that in the methodology? I think I think we can't do that, and that's also why when we publish these things, we we are very we describe in detail where, where like we describe that these are Danish participants, their age group, their, their gender, and so on. So, so that's all we can do. And then someone else from another part of the world can replicate it. And then we have more data on it. Okay. Um, let's see for uh, Sluo at cca.edu. All right, CCA. Um, asks for smaller size fonts, would it be better to use them in more weight, say medium, to improve the legibility. So for example, the caption type under the graphics, should it be used in medium six point? This question has bothered me for a long time. Very much looking forward to your answer, Sophie. Yeah, I would say so. Yes. The answer is yes. Bold, bold, bolder captions, yes. Okay. But that also, so so that being said, it's also, so so I'm interested in legibility, but it's not like, I think that everything should be legible. I think it also it very much depends on on the reading situation or, or the aim of of the of the work, the, the the graphic design work that that you you're you're working on. Like it, so you can have posters for for young hip people where you don't need to think about it, and then you have older people where obviously you need to ha have it as a consideration. Uh, I think in in my view, it's just it's important to know the rules for to break them basically yeah okay fantastic um oh dear i am sorry jerry i'm i have no idea how to pronounce your name jerry toman asked can regional both linguistic and typographical customs affect the legibility in other words knowledge of both Latin and Cyrillic in relation to the shape of a numeral three or the typical word length of a given language and its relation to the preferred letter width. Thinking Welsh maybe, right? With those words that go on for days. Yeah, well, possibly. And, and I, th I think uh, there, there's so many things to, to find out still, but definitely, definitely. Uh, so different languages have, have different traditions and, and also cultures, uh, and that would probably affect it. We need to, we need more data to, to look into that. Yeah. Okay. More data needed, more research. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, Amanda Weiss, Weiss asked, how did you choose which individual letters to show in the test? Like yeah, K, so, e, for example. 
Yeah, so so that depends on on the on what we are looking into. For example, the one with with the with with the open and closed counters, that was kind of obvious what which one to choose. Uh, other ones where 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 it wasn't so obvious, then then we chose. I think we some some of them we chose all the letters. Others we chose. I think we had like sixteen of the letters. So we took took out letters where there was sort of the same element parts of it. Um, but generally, we we had as many letters as so the, so it, participants expected every single letter to come up basically, not eliminating anyone. All right, um, Lil, are you exhausted yet? No, Lillian that's all right. <laughs> Lillian <laughs> Cheng wants to know. Ultimately, when you say one font is less legible or more difficult to recognize. How big is that difference? Are we talking microseconds? At the end of the day, if the difference is minor, is it worth switching out? And then Lillian asks, what is the most legible font? Which I think you already answered. Yeah. yeah. Okay, to, to, yeah. So yes, that's a good point. So, so, so when, when, when you work in science, you're interested in, in significance dif differences. Uh, and, and that means that, that um, and these differences are typically small, uh, but but as long as there's an overall tendency, we can say that there's a difference. Um, I think I think, for example, in the case of of uh, of the digits where, where we we showed this uh, difference in complexity, that that difference was really big, and I think that one would would have an effect on on reading. In the other cases, you could say yeah. In in and and back to my previous point. If it doesn't make sense to me to focus on this in this specific reading uh, design situation, then it's all pros and cons, I think. Sometimes the differences are small, but they are significant. Mean, mean, meaning that it's it's above chance that they're different, basically. It's about, I'm sorry, there for a second. It's above what? So I'm just trying to so when, when I talk about significance that that means so within statistics that means that that we are above, above the the risk of it being a chance that there's a difference between a and b. Okay. Uh, Fernando Sanchez Hernandez asks have you tested the effect of these font features on memory. Great question, Fernando. Like how long people are able to remember content as a function mm -hmm. of uh, some of these features? Yeah, but we, we haven't done that. I, I have seen some work on that in relation to memory, but the, like the whole, like memory is a huge research field. So I haven't really dared to look, look into that, but the, also, in, in, so it, it, it has been a case in relation to, uh, as, as we talked about earlier, in relation to sort of uh, funds being difficult to recognize. Uh, and, and I seem to remember a, a, an older paper where, where they looked at different uh, handwriting styles and, and showing that, that the weird handwriting styles actually make it easier to remember something. So, that, so some have shown something related to that, but uh, it's not my memory is not my field. Yeah, okay. It maybe it sort of relates to like the challenges involved in reading something may make it stick a little better. That sort of yeah, seems like the yeah. same, same question. Uh, even though you might find it painful to read, it might stick better. Who knows? Um, okay. Adam says super fascinating and mind opening research. He completely agree. Um, you mentioned that it's tested on normal people. Uh, I was wondering if uh, these um, can be applied to people with dyslexia. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. This, this dyslexia is is an interesting research field that I that I haven't really digged into yet. Um, we we don't recruit we don't exclude dyslexic people when we recruit, um, and that is because uh, so the, 
the, the understanding of dyslexia is has mostly to do with phonological deficits and not so much uh, perceptual deficits. Uh, that being said, uh, research has also shown that that apparently a subgroup of people with dyslexia suffer more from crowding than uh, than others would do. So, so some people with dyslexia might benefit from from reading texts of wider spacing. Uh, but I haven't worked with dyslexia yet. I, I really want to do it, but uh, yeah, so that's for the future. Yeah. I, I'm a little bit dyslexic myself, so. Oh, me, me too. I, so I look forward yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Um, okay, uh, Jason Pantal says, uh, what do you think about putting more control into the hands of the reader to tail the typo tailor the typography for themselves? In other words, the font itself or variable axes, spacing, etc. It seems like that might help address the broad set of seemingly contradictory findings. Good question, Jason. Yeah, true. And 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 this is also something that I'm I'm very interested in at the moment. This whole aspect of how of, of whether we can personalize the, the uh, fun choice for ourselves and and again i think it, it so in the future it's interesting so whether so can we do we do it manually do do we sort of make a choice do we know what what is best for us basically or would we need to to take a test and then see so the best fun for me might not be the best one for you um, and and that is basically you could say that with digital te technology that that is uh, getting possible now uh, that we don't all have to read the same font style that we can we can decide for ourselves. Uh, so I think I think that great possibilities in that. And 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 we also so we also in the early stages of experiments looking into that where we basically show that that uh, there can be so different people can can benefit from different uh, font styles. So so when 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 we overall when we have an overall picture we can see okay so there's a tendency in one direction. But within that, there are always outliers. There's always someone who has a different performance than, than the majority. Uh, and obviously, we should like with 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 the technology we have today, we should allow for 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 that person also to read with the best possible fund, basically. Yeah, that would be super interesting mm -hmm. to find out some find some kind of test that we could do and see which font we read better and then be able to customize our reading to to suit that maybe maybe yeah. your uh, research will help us there um katie hammett asks do you have any insights or oh i think we already answered this one uh, insights or thoughts as to how your findings could help improve type legibility for people with dys dyslexia um we already did that one um unless you have any additional input no. okay um Let's see. Um, Lisa Zimmerman says, how was letter recognition tested exactly? Okay, so so yeah, different experiments, but but generally, so you 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 sit in front of the screen and 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 you have a chin rest where so we control the distance from the screen. Uh, and then and then um, you have a dot in the middle, you focus there. And then the letters are exposed in somewhere on the screen, depending on the experiment. And after that, after the letter disappear, there's there's what we call a mask, so which basically remove the image of of the letter from the retina, because if we don't have that, then it would the image will actually stay on the retina. So we need to remove that. Um, and then so so, so you you can, you can use eye tracking to sort of check whether the people actually if they move their eyes but but what we've done is that we ask the participant to report if you sort of if you mo move your focus away from the dot then you you press another key on the keyboard so we we can exclude that data wow that is fascinating it's true it leaves that little uh like when you stare at a light too long it leaves the yeah exactly thing yeah. right yeah. oh my god um in the chin rest thing that's like being at the optometrist pretty much yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, Wayne Thompson asked, great question, Wayne. What was the sample size of participants? Oh, that, that varies. So, so um, for example, in, in the one with the, with, with the digits, we, I think we have very few. I think we had like, I can't remember, but, but seven or something like that. But then we, we, we have a lot of data on the individual person. So, so collectively, we get a lot of data, but from fewer people, basically. 
Um, normally, I think what we run between 20 and 30. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. Is it hard? I'm just curious, is it hard to recruit people for this stuff? Um, no, we, we have a website that where, that where there are a lot of medical uh, research projects that you can assign yourself to. Um, okay, I want to remind everybody to put your questions in the Q&A, uh, not in the chat. I mean, you can put them in the chat too, but um, we'll see them in the Q&A. And also please upvote questions that you want to see answered. We have uh, approximately uh, 15 minutes left, so we can maybe get through all these questions, but we still have 31. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Shessa, one of our Type West students, asks, what is that poster behind you with the circles? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, actually. It, it was something like I, 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 found, I found it on, on, like on the floor one day here at the academy, and I thought that, that shouldn't disappear. I think, I think, it was, I think it, it's from an old color uh, class. It's oh. lovely, isn't it? I like it. Yeah. Glad you rescued it. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hannes Famira asks, in your experiments, do you make a difference between types made for disease and body text application? OK, could, could you please repeat that? I, I lost you there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you make a difference? between typefaces, I think you did actually, typefaces made for display versus body text application. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, I think the, these, these, these are sort of the, the main differences when, when you look for legibility, that there are different parameters for these two, uh, that, that for, for display, you, you need to sort of, you need to be able to identify, it's more important to identify the individual letter while for, for longer reading, uh, different things uh, are in play that it needs to be, probably needs to be more conservative in style, the, the, the fund. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think you kind of touched on that when you were talking about uh, legibility versus readability, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Sandra Garcia. Ask what kind of audience did you study? Experienced readers, regular readers, first readers, and how does the reader's experience affect the studies? Um, that is a good question. Um, it, depend, it, it, it depends on the methodology, how the, the reader's experience uh, affected. You could say that if like experienced readers often have more, uh, sort of steady performance so they don't vary as much within a session while unexperienced readers they can like go in many different directions doing doing a test session um but but we recruit so we yeah so most of the people we recruit as students um so yeah and 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 that that is the case like that that is the case within science that that most of the the results within science come from testing students, and which is which is you could say is um, is can be problematic because they are not representative of every single person on earth. But that's how it is. But it does sound like you went out of your way to find uh, older subjects as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Recruit, which doesn't mean they're older. Um, oh. So so yeah. so that's the thing so we, we did we did the we have done the low vision experiments and we've done the one with older participants but that that really needs some work uh, the easy thing is to get the younger ones um so we so we can't we can't do the difficult ones every time basically okay aya elgindi asks are there any books that you recommend about this topic for further reading yeah or I could recommend my own books. Yeah, there you yeah. go. <laughs> OK, we've got lots of links to those in the chat. So if you want to hook up with um, one of Sophie's books, we told you where to get it. Um, anything besides uh, your own? I think so. So at, at the moment, mo most of this 
this unfortunately this material is is in in sort of difficult to access uh, academic papers um, so that is also why I, I plan to write like in the near future I want to write I have ideas for several books where I want to write about this so for the design audience because for me me as a designer I'm it doesn't make sense not communicating this knowledge to designers I, I don't want to just like be in a close circle of researchers that 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 doesn't sort of contribute to the world so so I definitely this is one on my, my the top of my list to, to write about this in a design language absolutely i mean what's the point of doing this research if we can't apply it for yeah exactly right? yeah. Um, okay isabella suma asks have you found oh good question have you found significant differences in the legibility of uppercase versus lowercase letters and i guess one could add um you know uh capitalization versus non mm. right Maybe in this case I, I haven't done any of that, but but I remember others have done that, and 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 it's 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 a while ago since I read that, but but I think the finding was that basically that it depends it 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 depends on the size that you're testing. So so and and that comes back to also being knowing what it is that you're testing. So if you if you compare twelve point capital letters with twelve point lowercase letters in which can you read in a smaller size that is an unfair comparison uh, because obviously the capital letters will come out as as uh, as the better uh, so you need to control for that factor also and how how do you actually what 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 is the right size comparison so that's another question but i, I seem to remember an experiment i think is kind of interesting is that where, where they tested um, uh, how easy people could read uh, so I think it was street names or, or city names or something like that, and found that that the, with with an initial capitalization, it was easier to read uh, uh, city names when you knew the cities, um, because and I think that sort of go, comes back to that we and we are familiar with that word image basically. Oh, it, it only seemed to help when you actually knew it and were able to recognize it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm thinking about like research on highway signs and things like that, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. But only. Okay. Um, ooh. Wants to know uh, well, what is research? So, sorry, I, I lost the forward. What's what's next in your research? What do you want yeah. to focus on next? Well, I, I yeah, that's a huge question. Uh, we, you want to know that of, too? <laughs> <laughs> we still have a lot of projects uh, now that we that we need to finish. But but as I mentioned before, I really want to write a book about this. I'm also so that's one direction. I'll, I'll I'm also very interested in in um, this idea uh, about how technology can help us read better that the, f the fact that the way we read today is so like it basically was invented at a, at a time where where reading in a book was the media and and i think that we haven't really like we haven't approached that properly enough that we most of our reading is on screen and and that the screen can help us a lot in our reading. Um, so I think that that direction would be interesting also. Great. Um, Wayne Thompson asks, are you from research for Microsoft, which showed generally that letter space and open apertures were the primary legibility aids? I, 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 I love kind of really but that Kevin Kevin Larson's yeah. research for Microsoft uh, would show that letter space and open apertures were the primary legibility aids. Yeah, that that was uh, that was the one that he did in collaboration with Matthew Carter, I think. Uh, yeah, yes, I'm I'm familiar with that. Um, so 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 that research project it wasn't it wasn't thought of as sort of a traditional scientific project. It was a project where they where they informed the design of, of, of the typeface uh, and then published on that, which I think is, is amazing because we, we need we need more background information on 
on on new new typefaces that uh, and it's a shame that it often is not published and they did that here but but the findings weren't significant sort of in a in a statistical way as far as i remember okay but it wasn't like conducted uh scientifically is that correct oh i think i think it was it, it was just that they they it, it it was never supposed to be sort of a statistic uh, um, or, or approach to a, a statistic statistic measures okay okay helpful um reed jones is curious recognition or reading speed was compared to retention for instance ultra condensed had long fixations for recognition but did participants retain information better i think we we saw that question in a little different format before like, yeah, so that that is in regards of a, a question to the experiment I, I showed earlier. Um, mm -hmm. we, we it, in in all cases we had we had sort of comprehension questions afterwards where participants were to uh, answer questions I think two or three questions in relation to the text and we didn't see any difference uh, on, in regards of of the of the questions. So no measurable difference was reported. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Alan asks, how can we deal with the eye fatigue of readers while testing with them? Would this affect their reading drastically and uh, in turn the results? Yeah, I think I think that that is a very good question and and something we are concerned with. Uh, so so we generally try never to test more than like. 50 minutes uh, uh, in 50 minute sessions and we also always ask the participants to take breaks if, if they are tired uh, because because that would ne would negatively affect the the results definitely great yeah uh orlando rodriguez wants to know in which elements should i focus or where do i start when attempting to design a legible typeface for patients with visual impairments, macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, et cetera. So I, I'm assuming that each of these conditions is uh, affects the way that you read differently. Yeah, I think I think um, basically. So so the diff biggest difference between uh, for, for low vision uh, readers of different diagnoses has to do with whether you have still have central vision or not. If you don't have central vision, then then I think that there's certain, certain certain things you need to consider, like like the experiment I showed here, that it needs to you should design with wider letters and more spacing. Um, if if that is not the case, then it could be other things. And I think also our, our experiments here show that that possibly like different diagnoses needs different uh, design solutions. Um, and also, I, I have tested. I have, I have an unsuccessful test on low low vision readers on sort of a broader scale, where just invited. If you're low vision with a certain level of low vision, please, please come and we'll test you. And there, we didn't get anything because it was just basically all over the place. So, so low vision readers are just very different. Okay. Um, guess what, folks? It's 128. Um, let's see if we have time for one more question before 130 when we have to cut it off. Um, let's see. Uh, the upvoted question here is, I'm sorry, we're going to miss all these uh, other great questions, but the Q&A will be preserved. So maybe we can answer them later. Anastasia Lara says, is this data relevant for the more eccentric display fonts, those that are intended for use at large sized headings rather than body text? I think for large size headings, you, you shouldn't be too concerned about legibility. I think in those cases, you should just like make great designs. Okay, that is a great place to stop. Um, Thank you so much for joining us, Sophie, and everybody from around the world. And thank you all for your fantastic questions. 
Um, once again, please uh, check in with us at letterformarchive.org to find videos of our past lectures, including this one, which will be up in just a little bit. Um, and also to find out more about our tours and about our Type West type design program. Okay, thanks again so much for joining us, Sophie. This was amazing. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Yes. All right, everybody. Ciao. I'm seeing lots of uh, positive feedback for you in the chat as we wind this down.